Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to ahead and get started. My name is Phil Cates, and I'm the MSU Extension Field Crops Educator based in Lapeer County. And so today, uh, as we go through the virtual breakfast, I want to say thank you for joining us. I think you'll like what we have here today. I'm going to do a little housekeeping this morning. And as we get started, I want to ask that everyone please mute yourself as you come on and make sure that we can have a, a nice quiet time when Jamie gives her presentation. We ask that you sign in with your first and last name. So you can do that by clicking on the participant list at the bottom of the screen, find your name and hover over your name and then click more and then rename yourself so that we can keep track of those that are joining us and sharing uh, their information for credits later on. Use the chat box. That is a great way for us to be able to answer any questions. And as we go through the presentation today, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat box. It's found at the bottom of the screen. And we have the RUP and CCA codes will be given at approximately 7.30. So stay tuned. We'll have that for you in just a little bit. I do want to say that MSU extension programs are open to all. The collection of demographic information from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of all MSU extension programming. This is completely voluntary, and the information you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participates in this program. A link is going to be shared in the chat in just a second. We ask that you take a moment to fill out the information. And I'm going to put that into the chat right this second. So you should see that pop up at the bottom of the screen. And I want to say just thank you very much for joining us today. We are privileged to have Dr. Jamie Wilbur. She is our potato and sugar beet plant pathologist. She's going to be talking about Cercospa leaf spot and the outlook for sugar beets today. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But before I do that, I do want to say that today, we will have an evaluation for the virtual breakfast. We do these on a monthly basis. And so we ask that everyone that participates, please take the time to fill out the evaluation. It will be in the chat box and the link will be shared there. And I ask you to please try and do that evaluation in a little bit. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie. And as she gets started, Jamie, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Phil. Can you see my slides all right? Yes, I can. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. And I'm very happy to be here this morning. Um, I'm going to be giving an update on Cercospora leaf spot in sugar beets and some of the general outlook um, based on what we're seeing this season so far. So Cercospora leaf spot is the most severe foliar disease of sugar beets in Michigan. This is caused by the foliar pathogen, Cercospora baticula, and this is um, the disease that's found in most sugar beet growing regions, uh, but the greatest impact is in areas with warm, wet summers, such as our wonderful Michigan here. So uh, the individual lesions of Cercospora leaf spot showing here on the right are typically circular lesions. Unless they're stopped by a, a, a major or minor vein, then they can have a slightly more angular look, but they are quite small in the eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch diameter. They have a tan or gray center with this dark, can be red or purple, red or brown, uh, dark border. These lesions are specifically characterized by these dark black spots in the center and that I'm showing that in the upper right corner. The dark black spots are the pseudostromata or the spore bearing structures for Cercospora baticula. In periods of high humidity um, or free moisture, we can start to see the sporulation occur in the center of these lesions and that's the silver needle like a conidian. Those are the asexual spores of Cercospora baticula. So each lesion can produce quite a number of spores. Um, this can repeat throughout the season, leading to um, entire leaf defoliation and plant death. Um, 
a leaf that is completely symptomatic would have 400 to 1,000 lesions on it. So again, a significant amount of uh, inoculum produced here, showing a plant in a field in late July and then mid-August here. So we can see the progression of disease um, can be quite um, uh, significant and quite severe. Of course, when the fields reach this level of severity, this is a, a dramatic decrease in photosynthetic area. We do have some regrowth that's occurring in the middle. We can see that bright green, those bright green leaves here. That regrowth is also drawing energy up from the, the roots and decreasing our overall sugar content, which is um, also a, a secondary negative impact. So we can experience losses of up to 40% in, in our sugar beets, and that is both uh, root and sugar yield that's reduced, but it's also an increase in impurities and potential storage losses later in the season. Just a brief life cycle here, the canidia and pseudostromata of Cercospora baticola are overwintering in plant debris and soil organic matter. In the spring, uh, under favorable conditions, the canidia are released. They germinate and penetrate the leaves through stomata. And then we're seeing the, the infections, those lesions forming on the leaves. Eventually those will coalesce and lead to further leaf uh, defoliation of the plant. Conditions that are favorable for dispersal include rain events or wind um, and do require cloud cover because of some of the photosensitivity of Cercospora baticola spores. Conditions that are ideal for infection are in the relatively warm for a fungal pathogen, 65 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit, but can occur over a wider range of 55 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but does require a high amount of relative humidity greater than or equal to the 90% 90, uh, 90 range or free moisture on the leaves for several hours following rain events or, or morning dew. Overall, uh, CLS management is a combination of, of cultural man management, uh, varietal management, and fungicide management strategies. Um, because I changed the format of my slide, the cultural management side of this slide um, was covered up. But overall, we're looking at um, a three-year crop rotation. We're looking at uh, not planting near previous beet fields that had high epidemics of Cercospora leaf spot. And we're investigating in my own research program ways to manage uh, the plant residue and ways to reduce the inoculum in subsequent years. Another strategy was to uh, uh, apply appropriate weed management uh, because there are some, some um, other hosts, um, other weed hosts that would need to be controlled to help us manage Cercospora leaf spot. On the host resistant side, um, this can be difficult to breed for because there are several genes that are controlling this resistance. And historically, um, good resistance has come at the cost of yield. However, um, and as a result, no varieties are immune to Cercospora leaf spot entirely. However, there are new varieties with a new source resistance that are now available now in 2021 showing an example of one of these lines on the left picture here, this nice bright green uh, variety um, surrounded by some more susceptible varieties. So it will be interesting to see how these varieties um, handle the, the full season of um, other diseases and whatever weather gets thrown at us this year. Uh, but we're looking forward to seeing how this resistance holds up. Uh, for other variety information, please see the REACH variety trial results through the Michigan Sugar website resources. Some of our CLS, uh, much of our CLS management relies on regular fungicide applications because of our conducive climate and our past epidemic history. These are a combination of contact and systemic fungicides. Contact fungicides include coppers, tins, and uh, EBDCs. Our systemic fungicides include triazoles, strobilurins, benzimidazoles, and mixture products. However, we do struggle with fungicide resistance in our state, 
Uh, we have seen widespread resistance to the strobal learns. Um, and so we do need to take this into consideration as we're developing these programs. Some of the considerations I've listed on the right-hand side of the screen here, it is recommended to always tank mix systemics with an EBDC or copper. It's recommended to use full fungicide rates and to rotate chemistry. So we're never applying the same fungicide class or product uh, back to back. And we're trying, trying to minimize the number of times that we use a product in the season. Fungicide timing, of course, is extremely important. Uh, these fungicides, especially contact, are aimed at uh, preventing germination and penetration of the spores into the leaf. So it's always better to be early than late in our, in our case. These first applications have typically been timed about the 35 disease severity value threshold. And I'll go into the beat cast model here in the next couple of slides. But this typically has occurred in recent years about mid to late June. The later applications um, take place either 10 to 14 day at 10 to 14 day intervals or when the appropriate beat cast thrust threshold is reached, whichever occurs first. Some other fungicide considerations while we're here, good leaf coverage is important, especially for the contact fungicides. And so I wanna give a reminder here, our recommended sprayer um, parameters are 20 gallons per acre and 100 PSI. I'm showing on the right, just a, a grid of some of the different nozzles from fine to extra coarse and our different um, application rates. So this can dramatically alter the way that our fungicides are covering these leaves. And of course, for the contact, we want definitely more uniform full coverage of those plants to offer full protection. So this is just a reminder that we can dramatically um, change the way that we are covering those leaves based on our application rate and our nozzle types. The use of an appropriate tested adjuvant has also been shown to be extremely important. Um, I'm listing a few here. Others are, uh, other results have been reported and are available in the research results through Michigan Sugar Company as well. And just a reminder that we are not recommending to mix coppers with glyphosate due to phytotoxicity issues. Moving on to the current beet cast DSV levels in Michigan. So I took this snapshot yesterday. We are in the 16 to 49 disease severity value range, depending on the location. And that is um, largely dependent on whether each location has a uh, experienced rain events or several of them. I did want to make a note here. I've pulled a couple of snapshots from June 8th and June 9th. This was a period of two days where we did see elevated in the three to four daily DSV range, elevated uh, risk levels for two days in a row. And so that infection of those spores could have occurred um, in areas with a pest or high disease pressure. Infection could have occurred June 8th or 9th was the first kind of favorable period that we saw here in Michigan. To follow up on that, we did confirm our first Circospora leaf spot detection at our Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center with Michigan State University on June 16th. And that was confirmed by Linda Hansen. This was also the same week that a uh, a positive detection was made in a commercial field in Ontario, Canada by our colleague, Cheryl Truman. In previous years, as a comparison, the first reports occurred on July 24th in 2020, approximately, it was a delayed year. Uh, so there may have been some spots present before then. Um, and that was reported by Daniel Bublitz. Um, in 2019 and 2018, it was about mid-June in both of those years. So we're kind of on track with 2018 and 2019. So it is time to begin our foliar management programs, especially for beets 
past the 12 leaf stage or and a more mature stage, a little bit more full canopy. I was asked a particular question about alternaria leaf spot in Michigan. This is a separate fungal disease caused by the alternaria altonata species complex. This is favored by a slightly cooler, but still wet conditions. So in the 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit range and greater than 90% relative humidity or rainy weather. Air, um, this fungus is likely, has likely experienced favorable conditions in areas that have had several rain events after the June 7th, 8th or 9th range. So that just the temperatures and the amount of free moisture in those areas may have some risk for alternary infection. So just to be on the lookout for this different disease as well. Please ask us questions if you have any specific questions about alternaria in your area. Just a comparison quickly to 2020, um, we are in about the same severity value range as in kind of mid to late June last year. However, we didn't see as many favorable periods throughout the season until a little bit later. So we saw kind of a delayed onset of Circasper leaf spot in 2020. In 2018, again, we're at the similar uh, DSV threshold in mid to late June, but then we did see periods of higher risk throughout the season. And so we just had a, a higher epidemic that year. Um, this disease is definitely managed well um, using our integrated management strategies, but the level of pressure is going to depend on how our weather outlook is for the season. And so I'm glad that Jeff Andreessen will be following up after this. So with that, I'd like to thank you um, for your time and attention and special thanks to our grower collaborators and our funding sources. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, but I know we, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, so happy to pass it on to Jeff. I, I do have a question for Jamie. Jamie, do you recommend that producers should automatically spray for, for, for or, uh, Circospora, or should they scout first and then spray? They should be regularly scouting <clears throat> and make that spray decision based on their varietal resistance, past field histories, um, and overall specific location, rain events, and favorable weather conditions. So it's really a combination of scouting and spraying both, plus following the beat cast, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, anything else that you're seeing in the field that is related to sugar beets? Uh, that, that's been a problem, and I, I'm assuming that uh, Daniel Bublitz is on with us today, and I did see some uh, challenges a week ago with some sugar beets that have leaf miner problems, but it wasn't enough to go ahead and spray. So anything else that's showing up for sugar beets this year, Daniel or Jamie? Well, I thought I guess no particular problems that really need to be addressed at the moment. So we can use the rain though. <laughs> All right, so. I see uh, Christy popped up, Phil. Yes. Hi, Phil, it's Christy. Um, not to do with sugar beets, just a couple quick reminders. Uh, June 30th is the cutoff for any dicamba applications on extend or extend flux soybeans. So just a quick reminder that, um, you know, any of the extendamax or ingenia that might be applied needs to be applied before June 30th. Christy, is there something happening next Wednesday? Yes, we are having a weed tour and um, would love to see everybody out there. Registration, um, you can get on uh, the MSUE News and there's a, um, an article that shows how to register. And um, it, we are requiring pre-registration. So if you could register by, I think registration closes on Sunday, um, that would be great. Thanks. This is the actual first event that I've seen that is live on campus uh, for the field crops team in a long time. So I think that uh, we're looking forward to getting together and seeing everyone live and in person. 
Uh, Jamie, there was a, a request in the chat from Clay. Would you put up the slide in regards to the cultural practices? Thanks. Yes. Yep, I can do that right now. And I have a question for Chris Defonso. Chris, I have Western bean cutworm traps. Is it time to put my traps out? Yes, I'm putting mine up this week. I'm putting them up tomorrow. Um, and I'm also putting out um, some corn earworm traps in a lot of the places that I'm working. And uh, we've got some corn borer traps up. So if you go to the Great Lakes network uh, between Eric's uh, trapping in South West Michigan, and I know Monica and some others are trapping in Central. We've got actually quite a few traps out this year. So I usually think about 4th of July period, getting your first zero on, on Western Bean Cutworm, and then it, it ramping up into July. All right. And Chris has a reminder in the chat that any bugs or ID specimens that need to be uh, analyzed or looked at can be brought to weed day next Wednesday and she'll be make sure and she'll make sure to identify them. And I'm sure Christy and the rest of the the weed staff will be there to help out as well. I did not promise to actually identify them. Oh. I said I would look at them. You would look at them. I can't promise hundred <laughs> percent in being able to identify everything. Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> All right. Well Chris, I won't try and stump the expert then. How's that? All right. Chris, is there anything else that's showing up? Uh, things that we should be aware of? Any army worm problems across the state? Nope. I did have the, that question uh, this week. I've got Asiatic garden beetle, as I said, was emerging down in Southeast Michigan. We even have some soybean fields there. It's weird. We have some grubs still in the field and we're getting adult emergence. So we're getting this wide, um, this wide distribution where they've done some soybean Re replanting of soybeans that are then getting damaged again by the same beetles. We're still there. Um, what else? Uh, I'm just waiting again. Jeff's weather forecast is very important because I'm getting a lot of um, chat back and forth with Ontario. They were seeing some chinch bug, odd things that are dry weather kind of pests. And the, the solution to that is, is Jeff's weather forecast to bring a little bit of rain back in the system and, you know, replace the water the aphids are sucking and pre prevent spider mite and get those leaf hoppers, you know, diminished. So rain will help with the insect side as well. I have a question for Manny Singh and Jeff at the same time, and it has to do with this rapid development of the corn uh, in conditions with severe weather. I've seen a lot of stalks that can be snapped. Are, do we have the potential for that to happen again this year with, uh, I'm going to say, more severe weather and corn really in that stage where it's growing at a very rapid pace. Manny, could you uh, address that for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I will, I will have to punt it to Jeff in terms of how the weather is looking, but I agree. The, I was out in the field yesterday. Uh, corn is growing pretty quickly now, right? I said that developmental stage where it's taking only 40 to 50 growing degree days for every new leaf to appear. And with some moisture in the, in, in the system that is helping us, right? Jeff, any, any outlook how, how, how severe the well, weather might be? Especially here? given where we've been, I, I think one would have to anticipate a continuation with uh, rapid. We're not gonna see the really warm temperatures that we, we had seen earlier, but with the moisture added uh, in, in many areas, again, that it was lacking, I, I, I would, expect that this rapid development will, will continue. And do you think that there's a potential for severe weather this next few days? Is that uh, good? And, and I probably should have mentioned this. One of the positive things is probably not. This is not a classic uh, type of severe weather, like anything like what we saw Sunday. Uh, the, the primary threat from this weather system is, is just heavy rain. Uh, we could see some gusty winds, but, but nothing nothing large is, or, or, or significant is expected uh, along those lines. So primarily just, just rain. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's a good news, right? I mean, that I think I wouldn't be too worried. I was looking at some pictures from uh, uh, those areas Jeff was sh uh, showing of its severe weather, and uh, there were, I think, some pictures showing that a day or two days after the corn was uh, standing back up. It was tilting after some of those uh, uh, windy events, but uh, unless it's 
very severe. I think we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. All right, great. Hey, Phil. Yes. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, we do have a field day at KBS uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's Small Grains Field Day. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. If people would like to register, I don't think Jeff gave us a really good weather forecast for a field day and uh, tour tomorrow, but uh, that is happening. That's all the small grains other than wheat. Um, it's our barley projects, spring and winter barley. We have a cereal rye project, oat project, uh, some management trials. So um, still available if people would like to come out to that. Definitely right. on some boots. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. I look forward to seeing you next week for the virtual <laughs> breakfast. And I, let's see where the, I don't think that I missed any questions in the chat. If there's no other questions or comments from our specialists or uh, our guests, hearing none, I think we'll go ahead and close today's session of the virtual breakfast and say, thank you very much, Jamie. Great job. Uh, thank you, Jeff for the good news on the weather that's coming up and we'll look forward to next week. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.